Hello, everybody. With our portable microphone, we're standing outside, and we're right in the midst of a group who are passing by here on guided tour. Hello there. Hi. <clears throat> Do I have your name, sir? Poopy Campo. Uh, are you the band leader? No, sir. No, I'm from sir. Bismarck. North Dakota. that you have the same name. What are you doing here in town? I'm here uh, on a convention. Everybody oh, named good. Poopy is getting together in New York uh, this week. <laughs> How many members have you uh, discovered? Uh, well, it's uh, me, Poopy Campo, and there's another Poopy Campo around New York. Is he uh, a member of the group? Yes. Uh -huh. The Poopy Drake uh -huh. and a Poopy Langley uh, from the West Coast. Uh -huh. Poopy Nelson. And uh, I think that's about it. About uh, seven or eight poopies. That's a poopy par, too. Mm -hmm. Uh-huh. Well, uh, what do you do at, uh, at your convention? Do you... Well, we uh, sit around exchanging anecdotes and uh, uh, just that's about Conduct all. And any, collect dues. Any, any business? The dues uh, cover your trips. Uh, that's right. I, I, I cover my trip because I'm the treasurer. Oh, I see. And they're quite high. Uh, you were telling me before you went on the air. $1,100 a semester. So it's rather a... Uh, select group of uh, poopies that uh, meet here. Do you meet every year? In... Uh, every year. Uh, not always in New York, though. Uh, uh -huh. Next year, I think uh, all the poopies are going to get together uh, up in uh, New Brunswick someplace. Oh, that'll be nice. It'll be nice to be there right now. On this yes, it would. Uh, I presume it's uh, quite cool. Uh, two years ago, uh, we met at the Firth of Forth. Oh, that was a long trip. Were all of them able to get uh, All our poopies were there except the poopy camper from New York. He couldn't make oh, it, but every other poopy was there. Busy with his band or something. All right. Well, it's been a real uh, pleasure, and give our best to Mrs. Poopy when you get... Uh, no, it's Campo. Mrs. Campo when you get back home, and uh, we've certainly enjoyed talking to you. It's been a pleasure. Jack Headstrong. Jack Headstrong. Margaret Farrar. Jack Headstrong. Jack Headstrong. All American, American. <laughs> Yes, boys and girls, it's time again to join Jack, Billy, Uncle Jim, and Betty at Jack's headquarters in Hudson, where he's working on his newest invention, the telephone television. Now we hear Jack saying... I don't know whether to continue with that or move along to my atomic weed killer. I Jack, think... I was outside on the... On the uh, Quiet, Billy, telephone. there's no time for that Quiet, now. Billy. What Quiet, Uncle saying, Jim. Uh... I was saying I don't know whether to continue with the television telephone or to move along now to my atomic weed killer that's been... In the back of my mind for so long. Well, it would quiet, be. Quiet, Uncle help. Jim. There's quiet, no Uncle quiet, Jim. Billy. There's no time quiet, for that. Billy. Not quiet, Uncle Jim. Jack. Yes, Billy. When I was out at the payphone. Quiet, I saw Billy. Your there's picture. no time for that now. Jack knows that, Billy. He's trying to figure it out in his head now. Well, I think maybe we ought to make one more try here with the telephone television or television telephone. By the way, I think we ought to select a name for that now, don't you? Well, it would be a lot simpler if we could call it by some tricky name, Jack. Like. Well... Billy, do you have any ideas? Gee, no, I don't think I do. Well, how about you, Grace? Oh, no. Quiet, Grace. Quiet, Billy. Well, we'll go along then with the television telephone. Are you going to try it out again, Jack? Yes. Billy, I want you to go into the house and call me here in the workshop. Right, Jack. Why? Hurry along, Billy. Oh, why? Now, Uncle Jim, if you'll just hand that... Here it is, Jack. Not that, that. Oh. Okay. Yeah, you want are. some more ice? No, this is enough, thank you. Now, Billy's call should be coming in, and I should be seeing him crystal clear. I hope it works, Jack. Quiet, Uncle Jim. Hello? Hello, Billy. This is Billy, Jack. Yes, Billy. What do you see on the screen? I don't seem to see much of anything. Do you see anything? Yes, I do, Jack, and it's scary. It's J. Montgomery Sting. J. Montgomery Sting? J. My, Montgomery Sting? My arch rival. Somehow he's crowding our network. Well, here is bad news indeed for Jack. Once again, his telephone television set doesn't work, but it does pick up his arch rival, J. Montgomery Sting. Be sure and join us next time when we'll perhaps hear the explanation when we hear Jack say... And look, his water gun works, too, over the television. In the next episode of Jack Headstrong, All-American American. Wally Blue is up to some sort of hijinks today. Don't know exactly what it is. He's just signaled that he's ready to go on the air. So come in, please, Wally Ballou. 
Lou, winner of the Gormley Diction Award for the past four years, standing in the heart of New York's Times Square with a gentleman who is out to prove something. He has built an automobile of spare parts, and in just a few hours, he'll be leaving from New York for the West Coast to try and break the homemade automobile speed record. Sir, I wonder if you'd uh, give us your name. Martin Boswell. And uh, where's your home, Martin? I'm from uh, Santa Mariches, Long Island. Uh, Martin, uh, it's taken uh, some year and a half to put this uh, vehicle together. Did you have to have any special kind of permit to put it on the roads of America? No, uh, you don't have to have any permit. I had to go to my uh, filling station and get one of those stamps, though, to prove that my brakes work uh-huh. and that my uh, headlights, headlights. Uh, won't blind oncoming cars and that the car won't blow up. Now, we're uh, going to do this in two visits to you. I'd like to hear a little bit about the car this time, and then when you're ready to leave in a few hours, we'll be here to pick up the departure. I don't know how mechanically inclined you are, Mr. Not very, Martin. Ballou, so then I'll have to make this as simple as possible. Well, what I have here is a wine-cooled, direct-drive, rear-mounted engine, and... uh, By that, I don't have any uh, transmission. Uh, Once the motor turns over and I push the thing off, I'm right in direct drive, like a midget racer almost. Uh Um, And and I have uh, very expensive disc brakes uh, on the front and bicycle brakes on the rear wheels. Certainly uh, a departure from the cars that we're familiar with. Yes, and it's uh, quite economical. Uh, As I said, I'd probably get... Maybe 30 miles on a quart of wine. Uh-huh. And uh, you'll be carrying a supply in the car with you, as Well, you, you have to. Uh, uh-huh. As I say, I've designed this wine-cooled engine. Uh, uh, it, I've found that it keeps it cool, and, uh, of course, the content there, I don't have to worry about the radiator freezing in the winter. Of course. Well, it sounds like a pretty good idea. What is the record for a cross-country hop of this uh, sort? Well, you mean with a homemade yes. uh, car? Uh, I don't know what the record is. Uh, I... What I'm shooting for is about two months. Uh-huh. Just to get that... there will be an accomplishment, I see. Yes. Not many have even uh, finished it. Well, while you make your I'll last go minute... go from here through the Lincoln Tunnel. You want to know the route? No, uh, we generally know the way out there. Uh, roads are pretty well marked. Down the New Jersey Turnpike. Turn left when you go through the tunnel. Right. Remember and then, the I'll go, uh, then I'll go over the Pennsylvania Turnpike. Uh-huh. Then I'll connect up onto the Ohio Turnpike. Right out through to Indiana. To the Indiana yeah. Turnpike. We know the way. Well, uh, uh, while you're making last-minute adjustments, Martin, we'll go back to the studio and hope to pick up your departure the next time we're on the air. All right, fine. Once again, we're happy to welcome to our broadcasting studios Clyde L. Hap Whartney, the Regional Eastern Interbureau Coordinator of Administration for the Northeast States. I presume you're here with your report. I'd Uh, like to preface my remarks by thanking the National Company Broadcast for making available to me this free radio time. I know how valuable it is, and I appreciate it very much. Bob, if you'll fire away now with the questions that I have prepared for you, I'll be very pleased to answer the questions that I have answered here thoroughly. All right. It says, uh, Mr. Whartney, uh, do you have any immediate plans for the coming uh, fiscal period in which we're just uh, starting out? I'm glad you asked me that question. Uh, fiscal has already started, Bob, and we're making great plans for it. For it. Uh, Hap, I wonder if you could uh, give us a little fill-in on what the field representatives have been doing as they uh, have uh, been traveling around New England and the southeast part of Indiana uh, collecting the material which will later be collated for shipment to Washington. Later be collated for shipment to Washington. After they are collated, they will be shipped to Washington where there will be a comprehensive collation done there, and a, and a graph will be drawn so that we'll have a complete picture of everything. everything. Well, then, uh, after that report is uh, submitted uh, to Washington, Washington and returned to you, to what do you do with it? What do I do with it? After that report is returned to me, I then give duplicates to all my field workers, who then go about the... Uh, country talking with the individuals who are most interested in it. Most interested in it. In it. Uh, then what? After that, we return, or they return to my office, where we make a complete report in graph form and then send it along to the Army engineer, Army engineer, to the Army engineer. 
It's been a real pleasure having you here, Mr. Watney, and we certainly will look forward to your next visit when we hope you'll have more information along these lines. Along these lines. It has been a pleasure, as it always has been, to be here on the National Network Companies, and thank you. Thank you, sir. Now, One Fellow's Family. Brought to you by Tanglefoot, the greatest name in flypaper. Today's episode, entitled Carrying Out the Trash, is taken from Book 62, Chapter XXVIII, pages 11, 12, 13, and the top of page 14. It's shortly after 10 o'clock in the morning now, is... We look in on the butchers and we hear Father yes. Fitzgerald yes. Beautiful day, Fanny. Oh, did I tell you the folks next door wanted yeah. us to move our trash baskets? They say they're too oh. close to their patio. Move or the trash baskets? Yes, they say down back of the garage is all right for us, but for them it's a yes. an inconvenience. Uh, we always kept our trash cans out there. Right at the back of the garage in the hedge, so that we don't have them spoiling our own view. But I suppose it would be the neighborly thing to move our trash baskets, I suppose. Irresponsible young whippersnapper. Yeah. Well, here, you better run along out with it now. Yes. I don't see any reason why we should have to move the trash can. Well, it's only the neighborly thing, Father. Yes, fairly, fairly, fairly. Uh, well, all right, I'll do it, but... Uh, oh. oh, what a mess. Uh, all over the driveway. Uh, now the neighbors will be very upset. I wish I'd never set aside this day to carry out the trash. You have been listening to One Fellow's Family. Today's episode entitled Taking Out the Trash. One Fellow's Family is written and produced by T. Wilson Messy. This is a Messy production. And right here we have three gentlemen, two uh, garbed in native Bernice or Bernouses. And the third, uh, an interpreter for this group of uh, Arabians. Is that right, sir? You're Mr. Spivak, aren't you? That's right. And you have brought these, uh, this ace Arabian drill team to this country. Mm-hmm. Uh, what is the aim of uh, this tour? Close order drill. And they do some of the most unusual close order drilling that I've ever seen. I'll say that for them. I saw them yes, rehearsing. They, uh, do all the customary left, right faces by the right flank, column rights, column lefts, with a few to the wind's march. You're the uh, interpreter for them. You do speak uh, Arabian, is that right? Yes, I do. I'll give the commands and tell you what I just said. All right. Well, how many are there in this uh, drill team? Eighteen. Eighteen. And they're all lined up? It's a small platoon. Standing at attention there. And what is the first thing we will hear, Mr. Spivak? This. Very fine! The leader... I just given the order. Forward march. Forward. That was by the left flank of the march. Forty-five. About two. On, two on each end are going off hunt to the wings. Hope, hip forward. That, that sounds was hunt, hope, hip forward. Yes, sounds a little familiar. I notice that the two on each end. Now there's two more on each end have dropped off and gone into the wings. Well, that was my fault. Uh, that leaves to ten. The on, there are ten of these Ace Arabian uh, drill team members. Forty-five. Or rather, eight left on stage there. For a point! That's by the left flank, Barge. Well, four to one side. Four to one. Very complicated maneuver here, I, I should say. Keep in step. Well, now, there are four, four just went on, off the stage right there, didn't they? Yes. It's there, a very small The two stage. members of the team are still marching here on. Very fine! Well, where did that other one go? Run off to the wing. I'm all alone here. i got to bring myself oh, to I, a halt. Oh, that's you. Very fine! I just said halt to me. Well, very good. Uh, I understood that last command there. Uh, where do you expect to take these uh, people? Well, just before we went on the air, we had a call from Ed Sullivan, like us on his... On the show? His television show. Oh, well, swell. Well, 
I hope this. You have a great deal of success if you can find them. Uh, they'll be all right. All right. Thanks, Mr. Speedway. Time now for the new and exciting quiz game, Hodgepodge. <laughs> now, here's our Hodgepodge Master of Ceremonies, Mr. Quiz Show himself, Bert Lucky Haggis. <laughs> Thank you, Ken, and hello, everybody, and let's get ready to play hodgepodge. But first, we'll briefly outline the simple rules on how our contestants can compete for valuable cash and prizes. Now, each contestant is given $10,000 worth of plastic chips to play with. Now, these chips can be used either to bid with or to purchase the prizes outright if they can get past the first phase, the feat of strength and daring. Right you are, Ken, and that's where the contestant gets the spiked shoes so they won't slip when they dash down the dirt runway to pick up the 15-pound steel balls and throw them at the giant lit-up hodgepodge sign. The idea, of course, being to knock out as many letters as possible in the words hodgepodge within the five-second time limit. And then we get to the giant jackpot bonanza, where the contestant, depending on the number of letters knocked out, Gets a look at the prizes, and he can either guess the wholesale cost, or by ringing the bell like this, he can take a question that has something to do with the use of the item. And, of course, you bid chips valued at what you think it is. Which is where the jigsaw puzzle comes in. Each contestant receives several pieces, which, when put together with pieces held by competing contestants, form a picture of a famous person or place. Now, you can either guess at it or buy pieces from the other contestants, which disqualifies you for the next phase. Now, before we start to play, here's Ken to tell us about the prizes. Right, old bird, but first, I think you ought to check the hodgepodge rule book under... Puzzle phase, chapter 8, page 70. I think you made an error there in explaining sure it. Sure thing, Ken. You go right ahead and list the prizes, and right. I'll check it on out. Okay, now, the winner in this round gets the all-expense-paid two-month <coughs> safari through the Belgian Congo by way of Borneo on Flying Vulture Cargo Lines, whose famous motto is, You Fly With the Freight. You'll also get a 1958 Ezekiel, the only 58 car with tail fins in the front and back. And a Pinto Pony, courtesy of the Ajax Pinto Pony Farm... <laughs> Mexico. Wonderful. Aren't those wonderful prizes? And you are right, Ken. The Hodgepodge rule book specifically says that a person buying puzzle pieces with his chips is only disqualified if he has less chips than the person from whom he buys the pieces. And now, who's the first contestant? She's lovely old Mrs. Hilda Schwenk, 78 years old, from New Bern, North Carolina. Wonderful. Well, welcome to Hodgepodge, Mrs. Schwenk. And uh, do you have your spikes on? Yes, but I'm a little hazy on the rules. Well, don't worry. We'll clarify them as we go along. Now, get ready for your first dash. Oh, I'm awfully sorry, Mrs. Schwank, but I see our time is up oh, for today. Oh, too bad, Ken. Can you come back to Hodgepodge next week, Mrs. Schwank? Oh, I don't think so. I have an appointment with my chiropodist. Well, wonderful. Until then, this is Bird Lucky Haggis saying happy Hodgepodge, everybody. <laughs> Say, welcome once again to the Bob and Ray Beg Your Pardon Show. As serious news gatherers and reporters, we are prone to mistakes. Well, we did it again. It was reported at this microphone some time ago that a Mr. Hewlett Tuckering was responsible for the disappearance of a Miss Daisy Merge. What we neglected to say was that Mr. Tuckering was a magician and Miss Merge was his assistant. Mr. Hewlett Tuckering, we're sorry. Well, forget it. Uh, well, what happened after the kidnapping charges that had been lodged against you as a result of our disclosure at this microphone? Oh, the usual. I got ten years in jail. Mm -hmm. Felt that I didn't deserve the sentence, but go fight City Hall. Well, we're awfully sorry. Oh, don't be apologetic. You'll become ill if you do. It's not too bad if you get a good cell. Mine was under a furnace. Oh. And I guess no one believed you when you told them that you were innocent. Well, I protested for a while, but I soon stopped that when they poured hot lead on my elbow. Well, that's terrible. I feel rotten about oh, all cut this. Cut it out. Cut it out. You'll have me crying. Well, uh, what happened after you got out of prison? Well, the magician's union had taken my card away from me, so I slept in the streets for about three months. And then what happened? I got sick from sleeping in the streets. There's a way to sleep in the streets safely. you got to stay away from where the water runs down the sewer. I was too weak to do that. <laughs> oh, gee, that's awful. We're so sorry for reporting Stop you. Stop apologizing. Well, I straightened out eventually. It was this very nice guy, CPA, who decided he'd take a chance on an ex-con. Gave me a job sweeping his office. Well, that's wonderful. And is that uh, where you're working now? No, no. He emptied out the safe last night, and I believe the police are looking for me. Well, Mr. Tuckering, we're not going to report you this time. How's that for being good sports? That's swell. And about that first mistake, relax. Could have happened to anybody. You'll find that's why they put erasers on pencils. 
Well, I'm sorry, Mr. Tuckering, and thanks for being with us. And folks, be with us again soon when we try to cover up another one of our mistakes. Oh, good evening. This is Alvin Hancock, and I'm standing in the garden of my palatial Beverly Hills home. I have an appointment to meet a gentleman from the All Martian Television Network who wants to purchase my Alvin Hancock Presents shows, dub in Martian language soundtracks, and broadcast them on Mars. He's due to arrive by flying saucer momentarily. Oh, here he comes now. Over here, sir. You people will have to excuse us. This shop talk would only bore you, so why don't you watch today's show based on the Handsbreaker novel, Body, Body, Who's Got the Body? And I'll join you later. Oh, Mr. Zog, why don't you slither into my library and we can talk there? Oh, Wilfred, darling, thank heavens you're here. Did you plant the bomb in the car of my beloved husband, Charles? Yes, Gwendolyn, dear. I attached it to the front wheel, and it's time to go off after he leaves the bank and is driving along the edge of the cliffs. Oh, wonderful. You and I can then get married. And with the money from his will, we can leave this horrible old ancestral castle forever. It must be the police about the terrible accident. Oh, hello, Inspector Blinton. How are you? Fine, Lady Gwendolyn. And hello, Wilfred. Is Charles home? He left the bank about an hour ago. He... He should be home momentarily. How are things going for you and Charles? Fine, Inspector. Do you think it'll be a nice day tomorrow for the Derbyshire Cup? I can't stand this incessant questioning any longer. I confess, I planted a bomb on Charles's car, and he's dead right now, a tangled mass at the bottom of the cliffs. I had to do it. Fine, George. That's a shock, Wilfred. You're his best friend. You'll have to come along with me for attempted murder until we locate the body. Why, Charles, what are you doing here? We all thought you were... Oh, you're probably wondering why I'm late. I had a blowout on the way home along the cliffs. Charles, there's something important I have to tell you. Oh, Inspector Blimpton, you gave me a start. I didn't notice you there. But I know why you're here. I knew I'd get caught sooner or later, but I had to embezzle that money from the bank to pay off my gambling debts, to keep up the mortgage payments on my ancestral home. I was going to put it all back. I'm flabbergasted, Charles. I guess I'll have to take you in along with Wilfred. I'll be in touch with you later, Gwendolyn. That won't be necessary, Inspector. I'll confess now. I planned on poisoning Wilfred as soon as he murdered Charles for me. I wanted the money all for myself. Well, it would seem I've stumbled on quite a hotbed of sordid crime. And ironically, I only dropped by here to see if I could sell you a few tickets to the Inspector's Ball. Goodbye, Mr. Zog. Perhaps some other time. Oh, hello, fellow Earthlings. My deal to sell the Alvin Hancock Presents series to Martian television has fallen through. They wanted to pay for them with Martian coin, and at the current exchange rate, it would cost me money. I'm getting frantic signals from the director that we've just run out of time, so I must bid you a quick goodbye. The current trend in radio, particularly on a local basis, is the use of the beeper telephone to conduct live interviews with people in the news. Now, there are several advantages to this, such as being able to interview anyone at any time, as long as you can uh, talk to them, call them on the phone, plus the saving in money because extra engineers and announcers are not needed. So, with a nose for news and eye towards saving a buck, we initiate the Bob and Ray Party Line, a feature on which newsworthy people... We'll be interviewed via the beeper phone. Ray, who did you say our first party line call would be to? It's Mrs. Amy Frumpweiler, I believe, whose recent magazine article in Clean House and Sidewalk entitled Kids Are a Pain in the Neck has been widely criticized by the nation's parents. Mm -hmm. Mrs. Frumpweiler is the mother of seven children and the freelance babysitter. I think she's listed in the Brooklyn directory. I have it here. Let's see, uh, Frump, Frumpish, Frumpner, Frumpstein... Here it is, Frumpweiler, Mrs. Amy. Uh, the number is Warbucks 52194. And we'll hope to chat with uh, Mrs. Frumpweiler in just a few seconds. It's ringing now. Hello? 
Hello. Uh, this is Bob and Ray's party line calling Mrs. Amy Frumpweiler. Mommy's giving the twins a bath. Do you want to hear me sing the one-eyed, one-horned, flying purple people leader? Uh, no, Sonny, not now. Could you get your mother to the phone, please? Uh, my daddy told my mommy today that the house is always filthy when he comes uh -huh. home. That's nice, but could, uh, could you call your mommy now? My daddy likes beer a lot. Mm. Do you want to hear a big airplane flying over a cow and dropping a bag of water on it? <laughs> I don't believe so. <laughs> Splash! <laughs> I just made it up now. Well, that's wonderful. Now, you're a good little boy. Will you go and get your mummy, please? Okay. What's your name, uh, Mr. Donkey Wonky Dookie? Tell her it's uh, radio's famous Bob and Ray Goulding. Bob, Donkey, and Ray Polly. Wonking. Collie, Mommy, Dookie. Oh, boy. Bob, mm. Wonky. Say so he hung up. Uh, yes, he did. Do you have that number again? <laughs> yes, it's Warbucks 52194. Yeah. We'll try it again. All right. Must have uh, thought I was all through talking to him or something. Hello? Marvin, put down that vase. Hello? Uh, hello, uh, Mrs. Frumpweiler. This is Radio's Bob and Ray's party line calling. About your magazine article, kids are a uh, pain uh, in the neck. Just a minute. Mm -hmm. Marvin, I'm not going to tell you again. Put down that vase. Why, you brat. You go to your room and wait till your father comes home. Hello, what did you... Who, who'd you say you were? That vase cost $20. Uh, this is the Bob and Ray party line. Per Percy, you tell the twins to get back in the tub this minute. I'll be right back. Uh, Bob and who did you say? Bob and Ray, uh, we'll call back some other time when you're not so tied up, all Yes, right? why don't you? Mary Lou, did you crane up that wall? Well, that was Mrs. Amy Frumpweiler, our first interview on the new Bob and Ray party line feature. And tune in next time when another name in the news is called on the beeper telephone. Let's not do it again. We have a guest here with us who does not have, by dictionary definition, an unusual occupation. He's a butler. But I'm sure you'll agree that a few moments spent with Mr. Sweatley... Uh, sweetly, sir. ...will be rewarding. Sweetly, I see you're wearing the regular butler's frock, or whatever it's known as, so I'd like to start off by asking you this. How come butlers always seem to dress better than their employers? Custom, sir. Didn't that custom start in England in the 16th century? Possible, sir. I believe it did. A rich swineherd hired a servant and commanded him to wear regal dress when he entertained his swineherd friends. And for many years, all rich English swineherds had well-dressed servants. Isn't that correct? Correct, sir. And wasn't the reason for that because while the swineherds were dirty on the outside, they were anxious to show people that they were clean on the inside? Right, sir. And that servant's name, the first one, as I remember, was Edwin Butler. That's right, sir, yes. And so we've tracked down the name and the origin of your occupation. Shall we go on? Please, sir. Good. I know our listeners are enjoying hearing you chat about your work as a butler. Now, uh, sweetly, I'd like to learn more about the clothes you wear on the job. Well, why, sir? Well, because it's interesting to the listener. Now, uh, it is true that one of the reasons you have to wear the distinctive attire of the butler is because when you take a coat from a person entering your master's house, you might otherwise be taken for a sneak thief. Definitely, sir. And you might clear up a point for me in this next question. Apparently, your trade is handed down from generation to generation. Yes, sir. And isn't it true that when an apprentice butler comes of age, he's handed a can of shoe polish to indicate that he is a man? True, sir. Thanks. I was hazy about that. Thanks for clearing up any confusion I might have had on that count. Nothing, sir. Would you like a blackberry raisin, sweetly? Very good for throat strains. No, sir. Well, suit yourself. Now, sweetly, the phrase, you rang, sir... Didn't that uh, come into popular usage in the 18th century? Indisputably, sir. I think it was a servant of Sir Henry Rang who asked when he entered the house and met his master, Sir Henry, for the first time, you rang, sir? And, of course, Sir Henry said yes, and uh, another tradition had been set. Right, sir. Apparently, you're pretty well versed on butler lore. You seem to have an inexhaustible supply of stories relating to your occupation. I suppose, sir. And I'd like to thank you for appearing today. It was nice of you to stop by. I'd like to uh, give you this key ring made by the trap key people. It's the trap that really stays shut. Really, sir? I rather thought a pound note was in order. I mean, after all, don't be a bad fellow. I've given freely of my time, and you, sir, have taken advantage of me. Now, if I had been in your position, I've... So the to... word silent butler slip out of my vocabulary, and it's a bad day when that happens. See you soon, ladies and gentlemen. Now, once again... Tanglefoot, the greatest name in flypaper, brings you another episode of One Fellow's Family. Today's episode, entitled Phone Call from Clifford, is taken from Book 31, Chapter VII. 
pages 12, 13, 62, and 84. A little bit of 85. And a little bit of 85. As we look in on the butcher family now, we find Mother Butcher standing by the pantry door. Father Butcher is sitting in the easy chair. We hear. Oh, I can't understand it, Feli. <laughs> then we hear Mother Butcher say, Can't understand what? Then we hear Father Butcher answer, The fact that we haven't heard from Clifford for a week and a half now. And then we hear Mother Young say, man, for goodness sakes, will you let us get to the dramatic episode, please? I the sorry, same thing I... two weeks ago, and I had to call the agency. Why but... don't you dry up? Just read what's written <laughs> for you. No place in the script does it say for you to say, now mother says, now father says. If had your way, you'd be introducing every line of the dramatic portion. I'm awfully sorry. <laughs> I will not do it again. <laughs> See that you don't rub a head. Fanny, I can't understand why we haven't heard from Clifford for a week and a half. What? I say we haven't heard from Clifford in over a week now. I know, now. I know, I know, but he must be all right. I found it, young whippersnapper anyway. Who? That announcer. Oh, he is a pill. But anyway, about Clifford, <laughs> I would assume, though, that no... Spoils no... any dramatic talent you have. What? I say he spoils any dramatic talent you may have. Well, he, well, he takes the fun <laughs> out of it. Play Tries on. to crab the show. <laughs> now then... What were you saying? Uh, something about Clifford. He, we More haven't... I think of that announce of the matter I get. <laughs> Why couldn't he just do the commercial, sign on the show like all the announcers do, and then go sit down yeah. and wait until the end of the program and sign us off Not the way they do? Not only that, but he takes so long to win reducers, we well, never get to the final page of the dramatic Sport portion. jacket. He's always with some... <laughs> oh, there's a thief. Fairly, fairly, fairly. You have been listening to one yeah. fellas family. Oh, dry up. Only young Brought to you by Tanglefoot, one of the great names in flypaper. Tell you something, we'll have a different announcer and announcer next week. Well, I certainly hope so. Yeah. Today's episode, entitled Phone Call from Clifford, is taken from Not Book 31, any good appearing on this Chapter program. VII, pages 12, 13, 62, 84. It's a little bit of 85. Why don't you dry up, you old windbag? Wally Ballou, over now to Times Square, and Martin Boswell, who's about to leave in a homemade automobile for the West Coast. Come in, please. Wally Ballou. And the crowd is getting a little impatient. The police are uh, telling Mr. Boswell now that he must move the vehicle out of Times Square. It's uh, holding up traffic and attracting too many people. Martin, have you got all the adjustments made and uh, got her filled up? Yes, she's all set. Uh, I might point out that I think this is uh, the only uh, homemade car with a self-starter. I've uh, installed a solenoid by myself, which I think uh -huh. is a uh, radical departure from the average uh, homemade vehicle and of this for type. for anyone who wasn't listening when we first talked with you, we'll just uh, remind them that this is a wine-cooled engine. Wine-cooled, direct drive, rear-mounted. And uh, that he's going to head uh, out of Times Square and uh, through the, the Lake West and Coast, Tunnel, through the Lake and Tunnel, down the Jersey Turnpike. Right. Well, we know gonna... the way. Oh, all right. And uh, will you get in now with right. our best wishes, and we'll hear the Thank start. Thank you, Mr. Ballou. It's been a lot of fun, well, and uh, now we'll start her up. I hope we'll see you when you come back, Martin. Now I'll stand back here on the sidewalk as Martin prepares to leave for his cross-country job. Seems to be having just a little little bit of difficulty turning it over. He's whistling happily, apparently isn't uh, upset in any way. Quite a pile of traffic behind him uh, being held up. And uh, what seems to be the trouble, Martin? It won't start. Uh-huh. Weather like this, of course, uh, People's tempers are rather short. Several of the people have gotten out of the cars behind him and are heading down this way. He's just sitting there, 
Turn it on the south starter. See, what I'll do is I'll go through the tunnel, and then I'm turn going left, to turn, turn left, left to go down yeah. the New Jersey turnpike when I start this thing. I think uh, those people are rather angry that are descending on you in a group. Would you give me a push now? And uh, if that'll do any help, I will, yes. Uh, so long! See you later. There it goes, just in the nick of time. And he's off for the tunnel and for the West Coast. And this is radio's Wally Ballou standing on the sidewalk, returning it. Lucas Littman, is this your life? Get out of my bedroom, you maniac. Folks, this is Rollo Edwins. And the program is, Is This Your Life? We're here in the home of Lucas Littman, industrial giant and philanthropist of note. And Mr. Littman tonight, is this your life? Are you surprised, Mr. Littman? Yes, I'm surprised. <laughs> but in a minute, you're going to be more surprised than I am. Tonight, Mr. Littman, because... we're going to take you to our Is This Your Life stage, where many of your friends are waiting to greet you. I think you're wrong, Edwins. I'm not going on stage and be leaped at by people. There'll be Mrs. Edna Garcia, your third grade teacher when you were a boy. Yeah, she was third grade, all right. Now, excuse me, I have to make a phone call. And perhaps you remember Mr. Beaner, the man who sold you your first pig. Hello? Is this the 68th precinct? I'd like to speak to Lieutenant Freddie Cook. That's right. You'll hear a voice from the past. One you haven't heard for a long time. The voice of your boyhood friend, Charles Moore. He's no friend of mine. He used to shoot old wine corks at me with a pop gun and make me smell like a drunk. And then you'll meet... Hello, Freddy. <clears throat> this is Lucas Littman. That's right. Say, uh, what's the penalty for breaking and entering? And then, when you were 16 years old... Well, Freddy, I don't think I can get him to leave. He's got that dedicated look. Well, he's holding a book in his hand about 14 inches thick, and if he goes through it all, I... Think you'd better come by and pick him up. Right, Freddy. And when you were 16 years old... Let me tell you something else about Charles Moore. He's crooked. Made a fortune selling defective garbage disposal units to housewives. The units threw back the garbage into their faces when they turned on them. And then, when you were 16, you had your first schoolboy crush. And when you get to the studio, you'll hear the voice of Alice Calder... A voice you haven't heard for many, many years. Well, actually, I never heard her voice. She used to play the kazoo whenever we got together. That's right. And Phil Spitalny, who fostered her career, will be on our Is This Your Life stage, too. It's time for the tragic part of my life, isn't it? Well, yes, it is, Lucas Littman. A tragedy came into your life when you were 21 years old. One morning, you got out of bed, and you found that for some strange reason, you were unable to read... Or right. That's right. The doctors call my condition one of the finest cases of backwardism they'd ever seen. And after that, your rise to the top of the industrial heap was a rapid one. Amazingly, you found that in the world of business, not being able to read and write was a tremendous advantage. Indeed, it was the key to your success. That's true. Well, when we get you onto our Is This Your Life stage, all this and more will come out. Oh, that would be the police, Edwins. Better beat it. Right now, it's unusual occupation time, and we're standing in Frank's sunlit little shop here, and we're going to find out a little bit about uh, just what it is that he does. Frank, I notice you're putting uh, some uh, announcements into envelopes right now there. Hmm? That's right, uh, Bob. What I do here at this little table is insert crinkled tissue paper in wedding announcements. Well, you are Invitations. one of the few who do this by hand, isn't that right? That's right, and it's very essential in such a formal type of invitation that they be spotless. That's why I wash my hand in warm, sudsy water mm -hmm. and then pat dry on a soft, warm Turkish towel. You can only use that towel once, I think you told me. That's and right, then and then we throw it away, and then I reach and get another spotless tissue paper to insert in the wedding announcement. And that way, they're always spotless and Let me clean. just, uh, could I see one of those pieces? Oh, uh, oh. 
Give oh, it a I, well, that one will have... I, I won't be able to... it out. There. No, no, no. You wouldn't use that one. No, no, I'll have to make a report on that. You see, we have a very stiff inventory chief here, and we have to account for every single piece of tissue paper. But they'd rather have me just throw that away than insert one. You I wash think. your hands between each... Uh... Warm, sudsy water... Yes. I and mean, between I... each envelope that oh, you yes, put that's... these in. Oh, yes, indeed, because you can pick up specks of dust just from the air. I imagine while I've been talking to you, I've picked up ten specks so of dirt. So when you go back to work, you'll wash your hands first again. How many of these uh, pieces of little thin paper do you put into engagement uh, announcements per day? Say? Per day, about eight. You got eight done. But they're per day. spotless. Mm -hmm. Well, Frank, thanks for telling us about your work, and we'll remember our trip here to the Fingerstipple factory for a long time. Welcome to The Heart of Life, the story of Gordon Grady and his wife, Audrey. Stay with us as a crisis develops when Gordon, a salesman for the Reflecto Mirror Company, tries desperately to get ahead in his job with Audrey's help. Is that you, Gordon? Right, Audrey. I just walked in. I see. Well, Gordon, I'll join you in a minute. I'm in the upstairs bedroom putting on my face. I'll be right down. All right, Audrey. I don't mind waiting for someone as beautiful as you, Audrey. I'm ready, Gordon. Here I come. You look breathtakingly beautiful coming down those stairs, Audrey. Well, the only thing that matters, Gordon, is that I'm here by your side. Did you sell any mirrors today, Gordon? Audrey, I've been meaning to talk to you about this. I'm afraid you'll have to tell Clyde Temple that we can't afford to have you sit for a portrait. But why, Gordon? Why? Well, I haven't sold a mirror for two months now. And you've been keeping it to yourself, sir? I didn't want to tell you. You sweet, untalented fool. Why didn't you let me know this before? Well, Audrey, because selling mirrors is my job, and it's not nice not to be able to sell any. But when I saw you coming down those stairs, I knew I had to tell you. And I'm glad you did, Gordon. I'll call Clyde Temple first thing in the morning and tell him that I won't be able to sit for him. Yes, that would be the right thing to do, Audrey. But no, I, I must have that portrait. But if we can't afford it, Gordon, no. We must forget the portrait. Audrey, when you're angry, your beauty is highlighted in a way that seldom happens to anyone else. Audrey, I want you to sit for Clyde Temple, the artist, tomorrow. Sixth floor, please. Artist Clyde Temple's apartment. All right, lady. Who installed the mirrors in this elevator? I don't know, lady. They were in here when I first came to work. I guess a glazier put them in. You're an insolent man. Sixth floor, lady. Clyde Temple's apartment is down the hall and to your left. Insolent, that's what you are. Audrey, what happened? You look as though you fell down a flight of stairs. Come in, tell me about it. Clyde, you know how I feel about sitting for a portrait. I want the portrait to be completed more than anything else in the world. Well, I'm a fine artist, Audrey. I know that, Clyde, but... Clyde, how would you like your whole apartment done over with mirrors? I don't know what you're up to, Audrey, but I'll have to say no. No. Be with us again soon, when we'll find out if Clyde Temple really objects to covering his apartment with mirrors. Or perhaps he'll discover that he's playing a lonely and a waiting game. Find out soon on The Heart of Life. Time now to speak to a group of folks who are visiting with us today and... Uh... Try to make them feel a little bit at home. I understand you people are all sound alikes. Uh, four or five of you here, and each of you sounds like somebody that we're familiar with. Is that right? I believe you. I wonder you if I could are. speak to you first. Uh, you are Chadwick. That's right, Lyle Chadwick. Lyle Chadwick, and uh, where are you from, Mr. Chadwick? Uh, I'm from uh, New Rochelle, New York. We've had uh, uh, look-alikes before, but I don't think we've ever had a group of sound-alikes. Could you tell us uh, who, who it is that you sound like? I sound like Edward R. Morrow. I wonder if uh, you could explain a little bit more. Is this a, an imitation you do, or do you just sound no, like him all the time? No, my ordinary voice as I'm talking to you now. How do you, you, know, you notice? 
This well, I is the news. I haven't, I haven't gotten it yet. Uh, have people this told you this or what? This is London. Yes, uh, that's right. Uh, that's a very familiar phrase that he used. This is my course. idea. Good night and good luck. Good night and good luck. Yes, uh, there is a resemblance there. At least uh, in the number of in the words that he's using. Well, uh, the, the, you see, to be some doubt. The uh, timbre of your voice doesn't uh, quite match his, I don't think. Well, I think that probably is the uh, the major criticism. I mean, who has told you that you sound like Edward R. Murrow? This fellow here and that lady. I mean, all members. Well, of they're the all members of your club. I mean, they maybe they sound like. They people. have no axe to grind. If I didn't sound like Edward R. Murrow, I'd be thrown out of the club tomorrow. Who does that lady? And I should be. Well, I would think you should. You certainly uh, don't impress me as sounding like Edward R. Murrow in any way, shape, or manner. Who does that lady sound like, for instance? Well, ask her. All right, ma'am, could I just have a word with you? Uh, we're rather you want to un... come closer to the microphone? Yes. Or would you much prefer I stand back here? No, I think to get the full benefit of who you sound like, uh, you should be on the microphone close by, yes. close up. Who do, who do you sound like? Arlene Francis. Uh, could you talk a little bit so I could uh, compare the... Well, hello, everybody. This is Arlene Francis speaking at you. And uh, Now, there again, you see, you're like the Mr. Chadwick here. You going to kind of talk about the timbre? Are you, do, uh, do you think that Mr. Chadwick sounds like Edward R. Murrow? To be honest with you, I don't think so, uh -huh. no. Mr. Chadwick, do you think she sounds like Arlene Francis? Well, I, uh, yes, I think she does. See, I'm so honest that it sometimes works against me. Yeah, well, I tell you, I think uh, you might make a search for better members, more accurate members, truer voice sound-alikes. That's my advice to you. And we're going to take it, too. Now, good night and good luck. And now, chocolate cookies with white stuff in between them brings you another episode of Lawrence Fechtenberger, Interstellar Officer Candidate. <laughs> Yes, it's time again to join Lawrence Fechtenberger, interstellar officer candidate, and his surly, snarling sidekick companion, Mug Mellish. In our last episode, the two had just graduated from the Space Academy and were awaiting their first assignments. And in the hall of the dormitory, we... Well, I see you just squeaked by, Mellish. <laughs> I told you I would, Fechtenberger. Lowest grades in the class. Come on, let's get out to the ship and take a spin. Well, I think first we should report to the Commandant to receive our orders. Well, okay, if you want to be G.I. about it. That's Look, tough about Jed Ordway, huh? What Not you, getting promoted? What are you talking about, Mug Mellish? Well, I didn't see her in the graduating platform. I'll thank you to keep Jed Ordway's name out of this conversation. <laughs> see, there you go, sneering. That's all you do, Mellish, is sneer. Well, come on, let's go to the Commandant's office. All right. Maybe we get a nice juicy plum for an assignment. Oh, sir? Yes? Lawrence oh, Fechtenberger. Oh, it's you, Fechtenberger. Come in, come in. Who's sir. that with you, standing in the shadows there? Uh, it's Mug Mellish. Oh. You want him in, too, sir? Well... He sneers a lot, and he... Yes, I know he does, Fechtenberger. Well, bring him in anyway. I have an assignment for both of you. Mug? Yeah? He says you can come in, too. <laughs> oh, you're sneering. still sneering, Mellish. He always sneers, sir. I hope that we won't be assigned together. Well, that's just the news I have for you, Fechtenberger. Oh. I know that you, as our A1 student, will be able to get along. Now stop stamping your feet on my rug. I know that you'll be able to get along with Mellish. You're the I only one. I can't can. get along with him, sir. He's been my roommate for four long years here at the Space Academy. He's driven me crazy with his sneering. Well, that's beyond my jurisdiction, Fechtenberger. Here are your sealed orders. You'll be taking off in the morning for Plutarco. For Plutarco? For Plutarco? Yes, it's a new undiscovered planet. We a want new, you to be the first to set foot on it. A new undiscovered planet? And you want us... But, sir, isn't that too much? Look, we're just... This is a little bit dangerous, ain't it, Commandant? I mean, we're... That's not the type of talk I expect out of interstellar space candidates. But isn't this a job for more experienced men? I mean, we just graduated. He just barely did. You graduated first in your class of three, Fechtenberger. Thank you, sir. Mellish was second, and Jet Ordway, unfortunately, will have to repeat the last semester. That I'll leaves thank you, you Commandant, to keep Jet Ordway's name out of this conversation. <laughs> And so Fechtenberger and Mellish received their orders from the Commandant. In our next episode, when they blast off, you'll hear... Who left the door?
door open. In the next episode of Lawrence Fechtenberger, Interstellar Officer Candidate. Hi, this is Luella Parkinson welcoming you to Personal Habits of the Stars. And today, with some sturdy help from a Hollywood luminary, I'm going to prove that movie stars are ordinary people, even as you and I. Isn't that right, Splinterwood movie star? That's right, Luella. Splinter, would you tell our listeners just how ordinary you are? Certainly, Luella. Do you want me to tell them about my personal habits? If you please, Splinter. Well, I sleep in a king-sized bed, 40 by 50. It must take you lots of time to get out of bed in the morning. Yes, uh, it takes me about 20 minutes to reach the edge of the bed. It takes us all a long time to get out of bed in the morning, so I think that can be called ordinary. Uh, do you sleep with the windows open, Splinter? No, Luella, I can't take a chance on leaning through a window at night and dropping into the moat. I live in a castle, you see. <laughs> well, we've all got to live somewhere. That doesn't prove you're not ordinary. No, it doesn't. After all, it's not as though I had the castle shipped over from England, you know. I had it sent stone by stone from Cleveland. A typically American story. Now, I suppose, like any other homeowner, you're handy around the house. Well, I installed a butler the other day. See, and I imagine you're typically athletic, Splinter. I walked around my kidney-shaped pool with a doctor every day and discussed the condition of the pool with him. That's exercise. Of course it is. No need for you to defend your position. As far as I can see, you're quite ordinary. Now, what are some of your typical hobbies, Splinter? Well, when I'm not at the studio shooting, I enjoy taking a spin in my chariot. Just as uh, many of us enjoy motor touring, Splinter, that's... Proves well, Luella, this is a real chariot. Oh. And does a site like that uh, stop traffic, Splinter? Only to the extent that the horses sometimes get tired. Other than that, I go unnoticed in Hollywood. Well, I don't see why you should be noticed, Splinter. Have you any other hobbies? Yes, I like to shoot pheasants in my living room. I find it relaxing and rewarding. And since you're a Western star, the pheasants are safe as long as you're aiming at them. Correct, Luella. Well, nothing out of the ordinary about that. Now... Can you tell us about your clothing preferences? Well, I hate to wear cowboy clothes when I'm not working. I like fedora hats and Italian silk suits polished to a high sheen. Well, how high a sheen, Splinter? Oh, high enough so the folks in the observatory at Mount Palomar know I'm around. <laughs> <laughs> and to prove that you're like the rest of us, Splinter, would you tell our listeners what your salary is per picture? I make $400,000 per picture. That's a nice salary, Splinter. Not bad. My agent's negotiating for a better deal. He wants the picture people to shoot the pictures I'm in without my being around. That would mean you'd be getting $400,000 for no work at all. That's right. Then I could have free time for doing other, other things. things. Well, there you are, folks. An enterprising and ordinary story, if I ever heard one. Thank you for being here today, Splitter, to prove that you are what you are. You may not believe this. That's right, folks. You may not believe what you're about to hear on the Bob and Ray... You may not believe this... Show. And for the first thing you may not believe, Leroy Simon and his wife, who live in Manitoba, up in Canada, have 22 children, all with the same birthday. That's right, July 2nd, 1943. King Myron of Transylvania weighed 742 pounds in his suit of armor. And if you ever go to Transylvania and see a statue of a man in armor visible only from the knees up... That's the original King Myron. J.C. Whitaker of Fallout, Wyoming owns a live pig made of horsehide. And did you know that a man once ran across the United States backwards... Or at least he attempted to. His journey came to an abrupt halt when he reached the Grand Canyon... And I believe that man also holds the record for free fall from a standing backward start. That's right, Ray. There's an animal in Africa that is a cross between an elephant and a fly. Frequently, the creature flies around and lands on its own trunk. And it seems hard to believe that people could put up window screens to keep out this type of insect. Yet, they do. And did you know that there's a strong man in Albania who can push a regular mountain? Of course, he can't push it very far. And you may not believe this. But if you play ping pong and use lead ping pong balls, in all probability, you'll have trouble holding onto your paddle. And speaking of paddles, during the Johnstown flood, 
A man in a canoe paddled his way into the sixth floor of an office building and suffered severe injuries when his canoe fell down an elevator shaft. Do you know that one of the silk cartels in this country is attempting to cross a silkworm with a parakeet? It's hard to believe, but it's true. What they're hoping to get is a worm that shouts out the yardage as it spins silk. Did you know that the Army is working on a missile so sophisticated that when it's fired, it'll head for the nearest cocktail lounge? Don't you believe it? Ask J.N. Kipp, owner of the Drink and Fall Cocktail Lounge in Sarasota, Florida. Did you know that at one time, each of us weighed 17 pounds? And this is hard to believe... But one night, a person deposited some chewing gum under the ever-tapping foot of famed band leader and raconteur, Lawrence Wilkie. And he had to call off the show when his foot got stuck. That's right. Actually, he started out as a walnut smasher. Did you know that there's a man on television who puts sunglasses on wine bottles? That's true. And one night, when a Mr. Harvey Pilk passed a window with dozens of the sunglass-wearing bottles on display... He rushed to a telephone and called the Department of Defense. This is hard to believe. And now, goodbye from... You may not believe this. 